I was speaking to a young man from New Town uh, just about two weeks ago, and he started a passion fruit, um, passion fruit juice business and is doing very well, and is doing so well that he has branched out into other um, juices, and, and that, that is really um, where we want our manufacturing to go, because manufacturing has a backward and a forward link, linkage that it, it, it really creates jobs because we use agro products like peppers and passion fruit, so the farmers benefit that sector. We're also going into things like cassava, and we're expanding the Toloma operations up in, up in the east. And, and also a forward linkage, because we see what the cassava man, I think he's on Kalibishi, has been able to do. He has taken a, a, a normal product like cassava, like all of us know our traditional cassava that is um, um, processed, especially in the Kalinago territory. And he has really added value to it. So you know, you have cassava cheese, you have cassava smoke herring, cassava codfish, you know, and it's really made it exciting and really bring it to the fore. And one of the um, things I saw um, in the new hotel at Kapinski, which really um, amazed me, I was blown away, is Ka um, Kapinski has a bar called, I think it's called the, the, the Fire Bar, or something of that sort. And they have taken all of our um, herbs and bushes, and they have put it into rums. Uh, so you have the spice rum, you have the poivre gine, you have the lime, you have all of the other flavors there, and they have made a display with you know, some really nice crystal bottles and they have it more as a tourism display for their guests, really, um, as opposed to really a tester. But all of those things are also available at the hotel. And even things like, like um, cocoa sticks, like the Prime Minister said, you have a lot of people around Dominica um, doing cocoa sticks. I was speaking to a friend of mine in the Kalinago territory, and she told me um, that is really her, her main business. Apart from her farming, she does her cocoa sticks and she sends them to Guadeloupe where she has a family member who sells the cocoa sticks in Guadeloupe and sends the, the, the euro back for her. So it's, it's really tremendous, and I'm very happy that we could support the manufacturers in that way. Another thing that gives me great joy, again, is I'm the parliamentary representative for the most tourism dynamic um, location in Dominica today, beyond the shadow of a doubt. That is clear. I mean, Portsmouth is the tourism mecca of Dominica. And with the building of the, no, I mean, I mean, let's be serious. Eh? I mean, I mean, we know that. We know that. The, the port and the bay in Portsmouth, what the Portsmouth Association of Yacht Safety and Security, better known as Pays and Cobra and Jeff and Sam and Blackie and, and Shem and Fabian and all the guys have taken a, 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 a humble, lowly um, organization, really, that used to be called Chesai. Because what they used to do before, they used to chase the yachts. On, they used to row out to the sunset anytime a yacht sight, anytime you see the sails. And they have moved that over the years. That was what used to happen in the 1970s. And that happened because, primarily because of the tourism attraction of the Indian River. And the guys would ply their trade on the Indian River and to a lesser extent the cabrits and, and stuff. And they have really grown over the years, Mr. Speaker, to be what they are today, a regional, renowned institution called PAYS. And they would be very happy, Mr. Speaker, for the exemption of, on the pleasure boats and pleasure craft, because I know that some of them want to invest in that, and some of them have already invested. I know a young chap who came down with a pleasure boat a couple of months ago. And, and, and he has been trying to negotiate and work with the customs on getting the exemptions um, on duties. And I'm sure he may be listening right now and very happy to know that um, that measure will be implemented. And so it is another step for us to grow the tourism industry and for us as Dominicans to take ownership and make our little investments and benefit from the big investments that the government has made in the tourism industry, like the Kapinski, um, like the Anichi, and all of the other hotels that will come on stream and will be expanding, Mr. Speaker, like Secret Bay and Jungle Bay in the future. They will definitely benefit from that because it's a normal and it's a natural occurrence for us in Portsmouth with, with, with captains like Captain Ricky, which is a young chap like me who owns about two or three boats right now. He does 
um, hock story on a big vessel, one of those old um, wooden sailing vessels. Then he has a pleasure craft. And we just jump on the boat on Sundays and we just go across to the Saints to just drink some wine and, and have lunch and come back. I mean, when you had the World Cup finals a couple of years ago, two years ago, between France and I think Brazil it was. We jumped on the boat at seven o'clock. We landed on the, on the beach in, um, in Saints in Teodaho. We sat down in a restaurant and watch the match, drink some wine, and then we jump back on the boat and before nightfall, we were back in Dominica, like serious stories, you know? So, I mean, in Portsmouth, we, we really would well, we well, we really welcome those initiatives, Mr. Speaker. So all around, and I mean, I don't even need to speak on COVID. The world knows that Dominica has given one of the best responses to the COVID-19 I mean, I mean, I mean, that is true. That everybody is looking at what we have been doing, and I'll tell you- Honorable Minister, you could remove your mask if you wish, oh, because, you, Mr. yes, Speaker. yes. And Mr. Speaker, what we are doing in Dominica is no secret, is no magic, is not a special formula. What we are doing in Dominica, it is because of excellent leadership at the top, at the middle, and at the ground level, Mr. Speaker. We have, here it is, we have one of the best leaders in the Caribbean presently existing in Dominica today, and perhaps the best leader we have seen run in this country since independence, Mr. Speaker. That is true. In the middle, Mr. Speaker, we have a doctor who has made his mark in his field in the private sector, making the sacrifice and giving up his lucrative practice to come into the public sector to serve his people. And as he got there, it's like God knows that the COVID-19 was coming and he gave us Dr. the Honorable Irving McIntyre. I mean, I mean if, if, if you didn't know or you were not sure that God loves Dominica. I mean, this is the prime example for you to know that God is on our side, Mr. Speaker. And at the ground level, at the grassroots level, we have the frontline workers, the nurses, the doctors, the taxi drivers, the, the, the firemen. I mean, my partners, huh? the, the, the port workers. You have my partners in Portsmouth, Double O and these fellas, you know? And, 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 and all of the people like Shem and Paulina and Titin who are cooking for the people in the quarantine. You know, Bubbles who are both there ensuring that the place, you know, is up to mark. I mean, everybody in my community in Portsmouth have just stepped up and we have just embraced the opportunity to serve our country, really, and get the country ready to be so successful in our fight in the COVID pandemic. So all around, I am just very happy, Mr. Speaker. And I, I like I said, I re I'm really not in the habit of speaking after the Prime Minister, and again, a very brilliant presentation by the member for the Rosso Central constituency. But because those issues touch the heart of my constituency, I just wanted to stand and make this short contribution. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. <laughs>
nothing in terms of keeping the people of Dominica safe. But at the same time, while we're doing this, we're also ensuring that the people's livelihoods are maintained. So having said this, I think I'm happy that the, this resolution has gotten support from the persons who have spoken so far. And um, I think Dominica will be in a better place after we've done all this, um, we've passed this resolution. And that's, that's, that's the intention today, so that we're in a better position than we were earlier this morning or last night. That's it. This concludes the debate. I will now put the question. Be resolved, be therefore resolved as follows. One, this order may be cited as the value added schedule amendment number two, order 2020. And two, the value added tax schedule amendment number two order 2020, which was laid on the table of the house on the day, which is the 20, what, the 16th? Yeah, 16th of December, 2020, is affirmed. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. The motion has been affirmed. I recognize, recognize the Honorable Minister for Environment, Honorable Kozia Frederick. Mr. Speaker, resolution, excise tax second schedule amendment number two, order. Whereas section 11 of the excise tax 2005, number eight of 2005, herein after referred to as the act, provides that the goods specified in the second schedule to the Act are exempt from excise tax. And whereas section 4.5 of the Act authorizes the minister to amend the first and second schedules of the Act by order published in the Gazette. And whereas section 4.6 of the Act provides that an order made under the subsection 5 shall be subject to affirmation resolution of Parliament. And whereas on the 9th day of December 2020, the Minister made the excise tax second schedule amendment number 2, order 2020. And whereas it is desirable that the excise tax second schedule amendment number 2, or the 2020 be affirmed. Be it therefore resolved as follows. One, this order may be cited as the excise tax second schedule, amendment number two, order 2020. Two, the excise tax second schedule, amendment number two, order 2020, which has been laid on the table of the house on the day of December 2020 is affirmed. 16 day, yes. Seconded, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, during the 2020-2021 budget address, the Honorable Prime Minister announced that the government will waive the interest and penalties due on outstanding personal income taxes, withholding tax, corporate tax, excise tax, and value added liabilities in respect of tax periods prior to 2019. The Honorable Prime Minister also stated that these waivers would only apply if all of the principal taxes owed for the respective tax types were paid between August 1st, 2020 and November 30th, 2020. Mr. Speaker, this measure has attracted much interest. More than 100 taxpayers were able to settle their long outstanding taxes, while a number of others have requested consideration 
on an, of an exemption of the amnesty to allow them more time to secure the funds. Cabinet has extended the tax amnesty to January 31st, 2021, based on its powers on the section 109 of the Income Tax Act. And government is now seeking parliament's approval to amend the excise tax number eight of 2005 to give effect to the policy. The bill before this honorable house, a bill for an act to amend the excise tax number eight of 2005 proposes the following. Clause one, one of the act, cites the act as the excise tax amendment act 2020. B, clause one, two, deems the act to come into force on August 1st, 2020. C, clause three, inserts a new section, 16A, after six, section 16. 16A, one, notwithstanding section 16, and subject to subsection two, interest due on tax that become due and payable in respect of periods before 2019 is waived if all the principal taxes owed are paid between first day of August 2020 and the 30th day of June of November, sorry, 2020. Two, subsection one, does not apply to any interest paid before the 1st of August 2020. D, clause four amends section 17 of the Act by inserting the following sub new subsections, seven and eight, after subsection six, seven. Notwithstanding subsection five and subject to subsection eight, any penalty payable in respect of tax that became due and payable in respect of periods before 2019 is waived if all the principal taxes owed are paid between the first day of August 2020 and the 30th day of November 2020. It, subsection seven, does not apply to any interest paid before the first day of August 2020. Mr. Speaker, we understand that these are very trying times for all of us here in Dominica and we sincerely appreciate and commend the taxpayer who has made the effort to settle the debt. As already indicated, this government is not a fan of tax amnesties, but we saw this as a time to lend a helping hand. Therefore, we urge the defaulters to take advantage of this very rare opportunity. Mr. Speaker, I commend the bill to this honorable house. I thank you. The motion is before the House. I recognize the Honorable Gregory Revere. Mr. Speaker, I rise to make a very brief presentation before this Honorable House on the proposed amendment to the excise tax number eight of 2005. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Finance, <coughs> Resilience, Economic Affairs, Investment, Planning, Sustainable Development, Telecommunications, and Broadcasting has oversight for revenue collection in the Commonwealth of Dominica. Fiscal year 2020-2021 commenced with a major challenge in the form of COVID-19 pandemic, which has been making havoc on a global scale. While this government has done an excellent job thus far in meeting its commitment 
in all its financial obligation. Its economy has, been, has not been exempted from job losses, pay cuts, redundancy, and even loss of export earning because of COVID-19. The productive sectors have suffered under the sheer weight of the effect of this debilitating pandemic. The net result of all this, both in the private and public sector, within the local economy, has seen significant reduction in their revenue streams for most of 2020. Importantly, Mr. Speaker, government data shows that for the period July to November 2020, current revenue fell by just over 120 million, down 47% from the same period in 2019. The need, therefore, to encourage all corporate entities to adhere to tax laws of the state by paying the requisite sum owed is very important. Moreover, Mr. Speaker, parties who are currently in default are being offered an opportunity to settle, settle the outstanding amount, and so avoid avoiding payment of interest on such amount. This, however, can be accomplished if undertaken by before January 30th, 2021. Mr. Speaker, permit me to cite section 17, section 17, Mr. Speaker, of the excited stacks. A manufacturer who is required to register under section seven and who sells taxable goods without registering is liable for a penalty equal to double the amount of tax payable from the time the manufacturer was required to apply for the registration until the manufacturer is registered. When we look at number two, Mr. Speaker, here again we are talking about another penalty. A manufacturer who is required to sell taxable goods only from an approved warehouse under Section 7, and who sells goods from premises that are not an approved warehouse is liable for a penalty equal to double the amount of tax payable in respect of the goods sold from such premises from the time the manufacturer was required to sell only from an approved warehouse until the manufacturer sells only from that approved warehouse. So Mr. Speaker, we are talking about a number of different penalties. And yeah, we have an opportunity to be in good standing, Mr. Speaker. We have an opportunity to be in good standing. And I must say that this, what better Christmas can we ask for, Mr. Speaker? What better Christmas can we ask for a tax amnesty? Mr. Speaker, it really reminds me, it really reminds me of the thousands of Dominicans who have already received their ham and turkeys compliments the Dominican Labour Party. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this amnesty reminds me of the scores of people from Marigot who received their new doors and their consignment of cement to improve their homes for Christmas, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this amnesty reminds me of the hundreds of children from Marigot and Concord and all over Dominica who will be receiving their Christmas toys compliment the Dominica Labour Party, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in its prudent 
financial management of the economy. This government has been diligent to support the development and advancement of the private sector. This has been evident by the sizable slate of concession offered, including making available highly concessional loans at the aid bank for unlending to this sector, of course, including the manufacturing sector. Mr. Speaker, to say the least, even under the most difficult situation, this government has proven its commitment to assist in growing the private sector and stimulating the business community. In 2017, government signed an agreement for a loan facility of over 15 million with the aid bank, 6 million of which was utilized by the manufacturing sector by 2020. Mr. Speaker, it is my firm belief that obligation go two ways. Hence, the amendment of the excise tax is just one way the taxpayer can meet its side of its obligation. In remitting to the Treasury that which was collected on behalf of the government. Mr. Speaker, this is an opportunity to be in good standing, a once in a lifetime chance to settle the debt. Let us recall the word from the good book of Mark, chapter 12 and verse 17. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. But on this matter, I say to this honorable house, let us give to Dominica that which belongs to Dominica. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, I just, I'm just standing on a point of clarification to guide the House on this matter. I, I think there is a, a jumping of, of the of the of the guns a bit. Um, the resolution should have been read and uh, presented, and then we go to the to the to the Act, the amendment to the Act. What I would propose, with your concurrence and the concurrence of the House, Mr. Speaker, is that we could defer going to committee stage on the amendment to the Act and allow Honourable Charles to present the order, to, to do the order. And, and at, at the appropriate time, we can go to the committee stage to allow for a, a smoother flow of the, of the process. That's yes, I agree with the Honorable Prime Minister. That's just an administrative flow. So we'll allow the Honorable Minister, Honorable Charles. Mr. Speaker, as indicated in the 2020-2021 budget... Hon Honourable Minister, just one sec. Um, just put off your mic a sec. Oh. Okay. So, we, the Prime Minister proposed um, that we go through, just for administrative flow, um, that the Honourable Minister um, do the resolution and then we'll go back to the Act. So, um, I'll just put it to a vote. Um, it has been moved... Somebody need to second it. Second it, Mr. Speaker. Nice. It has been moved and seconded that we change the approach for effective flow, that the resolution be done first, and then we'll move back to the act. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Honorable Minister, proceed. Mr. Speaker, I beg to read that the motion, the amendment be read a second time. Mr. Speaker. Okay. 
Okay. As indicated in the 2020-2021 budget address, government would move to exempt from import duty and excise tax motor vehicles imported by taxi and tour operators on condition that the vehicles are used exclusively for the transportation of visitors to Dominica. The operators must be registered and certified as taxi operators with the Dominica Air and Seaport Authority, DASPA, or taxi or tour operators with Discover Dominica Authority, DDA, for the last two consecutive years. Three, and must be in good standing with the Dominica Social Security and Inland Revenue Division, both in terms of their licenses and taxes. Concessions would be granted on a maximum of two vehicles over a period of five years, and on vehicles not more than five years old. Mr. Speaker, an order has been made by the Minister of Finance to amend the schedules of the Excise Tax Act No. 8 of 2005 to facilitate the implementation of this policy. Section 4, 5, and 6 of the Excise Tax Act No. 8 of 2005 provide for amendments to be made to the schedules as follows. Five, the minister may, by order published in the Gazette, amend the first and second schedules. Six, an order referred to in subsection five must be approved by affirmative resolution of the parliament. The order proposes the following. One clause one cites the order as the excise tax, second schedule, amendment number two, order, 2020. Two, clause three amends, one, the second schedule of the act by A, deleting the full stop at the end of paragraph K and substituting a semicolon. B, inserting the following new paragraph, one immediately after paragraph K. That paragraph one, motor vehicles falling under the customs tariff headings 8702 and 8703 imported for use in tourism taxi and tour operation services. C, inserting the following new paragraph M immediately after paragraph I. L, sorry. M, motor vehicles falling under the customs tariff heading 8703 and 8704, imported by members of parliament. Two, the exemption under subsection 1B. A, and two, vehicles not exceeding five years from the date of manufacture. And B1 shall be granted if a taxi or tour operator is registered and certified with the Dominica Air and Seaport Authority and Discover Dominica Authority for the last two consecutive years. Two, in good standing with the Dominica Social Security. And three, in good standing with the Inland Revenue Division. Mr. Speaker, visitor experience is critical to the sustainability of our tourism sector. Having a comfortable ride while in country enhances that experience. Over the past few years, this government, the Dominica Labour government, has made considerable improvements to our road network. So the concession on the vehicles imported by taxi and tour operators will complement that investment and also reduce their maintenance cost. The farmers over the, year, the years have been receiving similar concessions. We believe it is well fitting to offer the same to our taxi and tour operators. 
we have already put the necessary systems in place to administer this concession through the Ministry of Tourism, International Transport and Maritime Initiatives. We encourage beneficiaries to seize this opportunity and improve their services. Mr. Speaker, as we always say, tourism is everybody's business. And if our taxi and tour operators can upgrade their vehicles, get more environmentally friendly vehicles to complement the nature isle of Dominica, we are one step closer in making Dominica the number one destination in the region. With these few words, Mr. Speaker, we commend the resolution to the Honorable House for approval. The resolution is before the House. So be it resolved, therefore resolved as follows. that so in keeping with the decision we made um, we will now bring this matter before the house for debate Mr. Speaker, I rise to give support to this resolution. Before I begin this debate, let me take this opportunity to wish the warm people of the Rosso South constituency season's greetings. The people of Emsall, Silver Lake, Bath Estate, Kingsdale, Newtown, Fortney, Citronair, Wallows, and Castle Comfort, Lubier, Girodel, and Eggleston. Mr. Speaker, I know my constituents will have a joyous Christmas and they're looking forward to the new year. Mr. Speaker, the amendment to the schedule of the Excise Tax Act number eight to facilitate the exemption of the import duty and excise tax on motor vehicles imported by taxi and tour operators is an excellent, forward-thinking, and progressive move by this Dominica Labour Party government. Mr. Speaker, I want all to take note that this is happening at a time when countries around the world, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, are imposing taxes on the backs of their people. But here in Dominica, we are providing relief to one of the major stakeholders in the tourism industry, the taxi drivers and tour operators. As mentioned by the Honorable Minister of Tourism, Honorable Dennis Charles, this will certainly enhance and improve the visitor's experience as the taxi and tour operators are one of the first point of contact for our tourists. Mr. Speaker, the government has made serious strides and investment in the tourism industry over the years and is continuing to do so. And this is there for all to see, Mr. Speaker. Five-star hotels are being built. These include Tranquility Beach, part of Hilton Collection, Anichi Resort and Spa, part of Marriott Collection. And we have Kipinski in the north and Jungle Bay in the south. The expansion of Fort Young Hotel and Secret Bay Resort, Mr. Speaker. Various tourist sites have been, improvements have been made in various tourist sites at the Emerald Pool, and Spani Falls, to name a few. Concessions have been granted to hoteliers, and Mr. Speaker, 
the much talked about international airport will be built. So Mr. Speaker, the tax is waived for the taxi and tour operators will complement the investments made in the industry, which is so critical to the growth and development of our country. We also heard the Minister of Tourism made, made mention of the improvements to our road network. The taxi and tour operators no longer complain of bad roads or portals. The drive from the Douglas Charles Airport to the city is a smooth one. Mr. Speaker, the only part that the taxi and tour operators would have to change on their vehicles is probably the brake pads. This will certainly reduce their maintenance costs and leave more monies in their pockets. Mr. Speaker, we are offering a total package to our tourists and our government wants to ensure that the visitor's experience is a memorable one. This measure will not only benefit the taxi and tour operators, but the entire Dominica populace. As tourism is one of the most important sector which brings in much needed foreign exchange. I want to encourage our taxi and tour operators to take advantage of this, but also to caution them that while the government is investing in them, they must invest in themselves. <laughs> Customer service is key and therefore it is of utmost importance that our taxi and tour operators receive training in that area for the better good of the sector. So when the Discover Dominica Authority, DDA, or the Dominica State College offers training opportunities for you, do not hesitate to partake. The industry is evolving and is dynamic and no amount of training is too much. Dominica has to be the country of choice to tourists. And to realize this, it will, all of us must play our part. As we say, tourism is everybody's business. Mr. Speaker, in closing, this measure is a game changer for the taxi and tour operators, and I suspect they have been waiting for this for a very long time. But nothing happens before it time. Mr. Speaker, on that note, I support this, this resolution. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I just want to make a short uh, contribution to the, to the debate before the House, Mr. Speaker, because I, I think this is such an exciting time in Dominica, Mr. Speaker, and such a timely, this resolution is so timely that a rising tide will float all boats. And as we see in Dominica, it is unprecedented in the region, certainly in the OECS, Mr. Speaker, that there is no Caribbean island or no OECS island experiencing more new hotel room builds at this time than the Commonwealth of Dominica, Mr. Speaker. And that in itself is absolutely remarkable. And we're talking about world-famous, world-class hotels being constructed all over Dominica. We have the Anichi that's completed and was doing very well before the COVID-19 pandemic, Mr. Speaker. Jungle Bay, in its old location, was destroyed by Tropical sub America. And immediately, the investor expressed absolute and remarkable confidence in the leadership of the country and in the economy, and he rebuilt in a new location assisted by the Honorable Prime Minister. And that location and that new jungle bay is absolutely fabulous. And we can go on. I mean, one of the, one of the best locations 
in the region, they, they every, every tourism season, they just continue to get more and more accolades as one of the best honeymoon retreats in the, in the Western Hemisphere, one of the, one of the best small hotels in the world. I mean, Secret Bay just continues to grow from strength to strength. Although they were completely devastated by Hurricane Maria, they have rebuilt in quick time and have gone on to expand, Mr. Speaker. So I mean, it's just exciting times. By, by this government. We have the, 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 the um, Tranquility Bay um, at, at, um, at Salisbury, Mr. Speaker, by, and branded by Hilton, another international brand, a local homegrown investor, again expressing by his actions absolute confidence in the economy. And I mean, there are so many attendant benefits, not only the obvious jobs that are being created right now by the construction of those facilities, we have the permanent sustainable jobs that will be established when all of those establishments open up their doors, Mr. Speaker. But it's to, it, it really warms my heart to see those investors already their, their projects are not even finished yet, and they are giving back to the communities in which they have been established already. Look at what um, um, Mr. Uh, uh, Edwards have been able to do to light up the Salisbury Beach, and that is just a sight to behold, Mr. Speaker, bringing joy and cheer, not only to the young people and the, and the residents of the Salisbury area and the neighboring areas, but to everybody on the West Coast. And it was so great to see that we, the representatives of the people at that level could join in unity on that stage because the parliamentary representative for the Salisbury constituency was there. And I want him to stand right now and support those resolutions because you are a direct beneficiary of what those types of investments can do to your constituency and to your community. So I, I cannot sit by and not express my, my, my gratitude, first of all, because about three of those major developments are happening in my constituency and creating jobs for my people in Portsmouth. So I'm, I'm very happy for that. I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, I have a young chap, a chauffeur, he, he works with Secret Bay. He is one of their, their main taxi operators and he just ordered uh, two luxury vehicles because he told me the kind of clients that Secret Bay is attracting. He has to have the vehicles and the comfort to match the experience. And that's what the Honorable Minister for Tourism just referred to, that visitor comfort um, and leisure really enhances the experience and makes those establishments world class. Because even if you have a world class brand, your, your hotel is branded, or you can create a world class brand as Secret Bay is doing now, but you do not have the attendant services to match it, then that will undermine, Mr. Speaker, and jeopardize the experience. So it is the experience that has to go with the infrastructural development and placing that concession there so that the taxi drivers, the tour operators, even the tour guides, because you find it, Mr. Speaker, with the success of the tourism industry in Dominica today, a lot of tour guides are expanding their business. So I know a lot of the young chaps in Portsmouth who started off as tour guides with their rowboat rowing up the Indian River have now expanded and now they have tour buses. So they are now graduating, really, from being tour guides to being tour operators. They go into water sports, they go into restaurants, they go into small um, um, resorts with their bread and breakfast. So it's just a whole um, 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 dynamic spin-off in the economy, Mr. Speaker. And this is evidence that Dominica is on the right track. So when we talk about, and Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I just want to digress a bit. When we speak of the international airport, the international airport is a must because it is the international airport that will allow these establishments and those same taxi and tour operators and those drivers we talk about to have the kind of throughput in terms of personnel, tourists, and people coming through to be able to make their businesses viable. So Mr. Prime Minister, despite the critics, keep your head straight. Put on blinkers, keep our eyes to the prize, and let us establish the Dominica International Airport, Mr. Speaker. Because and, and of all the roads and the bridges 
that, that we are doing the Edward Oliver Libla Highway, the Nick Liverpool um, um, Highway, Mr. Speaker, the, the highway to come from, the, um, 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 from Melvin Hall all the way down to Portsmouth. All of those pieces of infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, will tie in to what we are doing here today through this resolution, Mr. Speaker, enhancing the visitor experience for all of us, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, I rise to win the debate on the matter before us. Um, the, the Honorable Member sat in this House, bills in his name, other members of his team announced to this Honorable House that they will be moving the motions for those bills and taking them through the stages. 42-1 of the standing orders provide that the mover of a motion, not the person in, whom, in whose name the motion stands, the mover of the motion may reply after all the other members present, present have had an opportunity of addressing the House and before the question is put. And after such reply, no other member may speak except as provided in paragraph two of the standing order. And paragraph two says, a minister may conclude a debate on any motion which is critical of government or reflects adversely on or is calculated to bring discredit upon the government or government officer. It is out of order for the honorable member to close the debate on this matter. The debate must be closed by the, by the mover of the motion. So, so we, we discussed the matter before, but, but just for us not to be in any controversy. The question is, we need to allow everybody to speak who wants to speak. So the question is, on the government side, if the Prime Minister consulted with members and no one wants to speak, then it's clear on the government side. The question is on that matter, does anyone on the opposition side want to speak on the matter? That's the question. So if no one wants to speak on the opposition side on that matter, then it doesn't matter who closes it on the government side. So let's, let's proceed. Do you have any member on the opposition side who wants to speak? But this is just process, because at the end of the day... It says, but the standing, the standing orders is the Bible of the whole... Member, do you have any member on the opposition the side... The do you have any member on the opposition side who wishes to speak? If any member on Merry the opposition Christmas, side wishes to speak, stand now. Uh, the Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I, I believe that um, we, are, we are consistent with the provisions of the standing order. Um, I, I did motion the opposition to find out if anybody wants to speak. They, they said no. Um, so we really raised a vexatious issue in, in the House that is going very well today. And I, this matter was ventilated last time and a ruling was made consistent with the provisions of the, of the standing order. And, and so, Mr. Speaker, I, I was saying that um, if we had the practice, you know, in the Commonwealth of Dominica to name legislation after people, as is the case in the United States of America, we would really be naming this, this piece of legislation in the name of, of Chris Flora. Chris Flora, um, who unfortunately passed away uh, this year. He is a taxi driver. Um, and he was one of the three people who came to my office to suggest to the government, and the other two people were Jana Gist and um, Renal Alcindor, who were members of I believe, the Combined Taxi Association. And they came to see me on two matters. One, to thank the government for the um, $15,000 small business loan at the bank that were, that were made available to people who were affected by COVID-19. And he suggested, they suggested to me that we should um, turn this into a revolving fund and um, the interest rate was fine, keep it at that interest rate so that they can continue to benefit from it. And the second one was to um, solicit 
or to suggest to the government the either removal of the excise tax or the value of the tax on vehicles. Um, and they suggested two vehicles. And they said, they said we should look at luxury vehicles because that's where the market is moving to in that direction because of the, the, um, the people who are coming into Dominica to take advantage of our country in terms of the beauty and splendor. This, so we decided to go with the excise tax so that it is similar to what the farmers are benefiting from. The farmers are benefiting from the um, exemption from the import duties and the excise tax. And so the farmers only pay 15% 15 on a new vehicle, a vehicle five years or, 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 or less. And so in this case, Mr. Speaker, the taxi operators will receive the 28% exemption of the excise tax on top of the already existing policy of the government of the waiver of the import duties on these vehicles for tourism purposes. So in, in its simple, simplified um, application, you're talking about a 68% reduction in the duties. If you use it in a compounded nature with which the customs are using, are using it, it will be more than 68% that we are, we are saving the um, local investors in the um, transportation business. The transportation is a major part of uh, the consideration of the GDP. And, and, and so we look forward to taking advantage of this. So what will happen now, they are entitled to two vehicles during the period of five years, and they will be exempted from the excise tax of 28% and the import duty on a luxury vehicle, which is about 40%, um, Mr. Speaker. So this is a major investment. This is actually money that we are keeping in the pockets of the local investors. Because otherwise, they would have to pay that to the government. So this is the government literally taking money, or almost literally taking money. And Giving, telling telling the, 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 the operators to hold it, hold it. And so you can imagine somebody buying a vehicle for $150,000 and have to pay the, the excise tax and the import duties and the VAT on it, the cost and so on, all the cost saving. I always have an issue, and we discussed in the Ministry of Finance, it's something that we have to continue. I, I always, always held a concern about the compounded nature of application of the tax. I, I believe that each of these taxes should be applied on the, um, on the CIF of, of, of the vehicle rather than have it in a compound in nature. But it's something that, you know, it's strange that the Minister of Finance is raising this issue, but I like to provoke things and for us to re-examine things and examine things and to see what is, what is the best application um, to, or how to treat with this um, tax. Because sometimes we have to complain about the taxes and we have a duty to listen and to see where we can make certain concessions to our citizens to be able to allow them to better afford um, certain things that can improve on the, or add to the quality of their lives. And I think this is certainly going to add to the quality of the lives of the taxi operators. Because most of them, you know, because of the cost, have to buy used vehicles. And some of these vehicles are very old, especially the coasters. Um, but so with this reduction in the, in the import duties, in the excess tax, sorry, it will make the, the acquisition of a, of a new um, or a two-year-old or three-year-old um, coaster much more affordable um, to the local investors than it would have been otherwise. So I think this is a, this is a progressive um, um, decision. This is all part of our wider policy of, of tax reform, uh, Mr. Speaker. We are, we are now, um, with the help of the IMF, uh, looking at the income tax rates and, and to see whether we could have a flat rate for income tax across the board, um, all in effort to simplify the income tax regime, but more importantly, to, to allow consumers, or to allow people to keep more of their, of, their, of, their, of their labor, their compensation for their labor, and to spend it in a manner in which they, they wish to spend it in a free economy. And, 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 and so we are we're hoping that in, in 2021, we could um, engage the public on, on, on this further once we get the, 
the report from the, from the IMF and, and to see whether what, uh, what, what we're seeking to do is, 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 is possible or plausible, and if it is, um, how do we go about implementing it, Mr. Speaker? So this is a, and I, I want to, to, to say that it's good that the government is keeping to its promise. Um, this promise was made in this year's budget, and we're here today to, to get the parliamentary um, legislative approval uh, to effect a policy decision of the cabinet. Thank you, Mr. So in keeping with the flow, so, it, uh, so no argument. Honorable Dennis Charles, you are allowed to close the debate. Mr. Speaker, I want to commend my colleagues for their excellent contribution to this very important um, incentive. Um, Honorable Minister, you could remove the mask, you know. That's, that's part of the protocol there. Okay. Mr. Speaker, as I always say, tourism is everybody's business. And for Dominica to become the number one destination in the region, which I believe we have the ability to become, it is important to upgrade our motor vehicle fleet. People must be transported in comfort while they enjoy the ride from the airport to the hotel or from the ho hotel to any one of our natural sites, being Trafalgar Falls or going to Roseau Valley or going up to the Cabrits or to Soufouré or Scottsdale. Further, because of the brilliant move of this Roosevelt's carrot led Labour administration to re-engineer the CBI investment option, we now have luxury hotel brands, Mr. Speaker. We have Secret Bay, we have Hilton Tranquility Beach, we have Marriott Anishi, we have Jungle Bay. So, Mr. Speaker, having those luxury resort brands require luxury service. So we need tour operators to invest in a luxury fleet of vehicles. So let us not be afraid to bring out our funds and go to the bank and invest to some higher grade of um, vehicles, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, and coupled with the concession on pleasure crafts, we can begin to see the picture of a dynamic Dominica in tourism, Mr. Speaker. Not only will visitors and locals, as my um, colleague Douglas said, be able to just enjoy Dominica by road, but now you can enjoy Dominica by sea, in comfort and in style. And so, Mr. Speaker, in order for all of this to also be effective and to and so to ensure that visitors have a wonderful experience, no matter where they visit in Dominica, the Ministry of Tourism have also been reviewing all our natural sites and in order to undergo a reclassification exercise. Because we have great sites that can be considered premium sites, and we may just have to add a few amenities to them to improve them, Mr. Speaker. Because once we build that build, that international airport, Mr. Speaker, we'll have tons of people coming to Dominica, and we want to make sure we have a product to cater to every taste and, and style and requirement of all visitors, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, we also do in a consultancy in, in, in tourism, as I mentioned, and we also plan to introduce some standards that um, managers of sites or owners of restaurants or hotels must meet to ensure that we give all our visitors the best experience in the nature aisle. So Mr. Speaker, whether you want to stay at a luxury resort or you just want to come to Dominica and relax on a hammock in the mountains, you will be able to do so. You'll be able to choose where, whichever place you want to stay based on your budget, based on your pocket, and still enjoy the great thing that this beautiful and diverse economy has to offer. I believe, Mr. Speaker, without a doubt, that in the region we have one of the most diverse, dynamic, and attractive country, Mr. Speaker, where you can go to rivers, you can go to the Whitey Kubuli trails, 
anything you want to do, Mr. Speaker, you can do it in the nature aisle, Mr. Speaker. And at the end of the evening, have a relaxing night rest or dine at one of our wonderful um, cuisine because we certainly cook the best in, in, in Dominica. We have one of the best cuisines, authentic cuisines. And let me not forget our Kalinago heritage, which is a critical asset for promoting our heritage and um, tourism, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, all that is required now that this government have um, implemented these fiscal measures is the support of the financial institutions, Mr. Speaker. So I want to make a plea to them to have attractive products with reasonable lending terms, Mr. Speaker, so tour operators can take advantage of these opportunities and new investors can come into play because the more we have to offer visitors, Mr. the merrier, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, tourism is one of the pillars that is really going to grow our economy. And as you have seen, this government has taken the steps from our infrastructure to our hotel plans to incentives so that tour operators can upgrade their fleets, that we can have more marine tourism with the introduction of pleasure crafts. We can see an increase of those things, Mr. Speaker. And then the final icing on the cake, the International Airport, Mr. Speaker. We are well on our way to building Dynamic Dominica, the number one tourism destination in the region. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Do you have any, I think, um, the AG, do you have any amendment to the resolution? Or are we going with it as is? amendment uh, required to the order um, insofar as uh, an effective date. Uh, but I haven't got the, uh, the draft of that, and I could propose something. So, um, Yes, yes, but that is not for the whole thing, you see. It's only for part. So, um, Mr. Speaker, let me just um, clarify, and it may be that I need to talk to. Yeah? Well, if, you, if you want to. Yeah. 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 Okay. I think, I think, I think you, you don't want to get from the FS. You want to find out? You're good? Okay. Mr. Speaker, would you. Um, Sorry, I think, I think the stage is I should be standing. My apologies. Uh, would you just bear with, with uh, the side for a moment? Let's get some instructions from the FSA. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, um, the Honourable House. The proposal is really just to amend the commencement date at, uh, in, the, in the order which has been laid before the House. 
which should be the 1st of September rather than the 1st of December 2020. Uh, the opposition side has a copy of this also. Okay, so you see this section in the commencement. So he's, okay, so the AG is proposing that an amendment that the 1st of September be the commencement date. Yes. Okay. It has been moved and somebody second the amendment. Candid. It has been moved and seconded that the commencement date be September 1st, 2020. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. So, this concludes the debate on the motion. I will now put the question. Be it resolved as follows. One, this order may be cited as the tax, excise tax, sec second schedule, amendment number two, order of 2020. Two, the excise tax, second schedule, amendment number two, order 2020, which was laid on the table of the House on the 16th day of December, 2020 is affirmed as amended. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. The motion has been affirmed. I recognize the Honorable Kassani Laville coming to the podium. See, I, I usually say I recognize the member, but it's only the members who are coming to the podium because other members are in their seat. But those who come to the podium, I, I recognize them so the general public can also know. Resolution, authorization for loan facility from the OPEC Fund for International Development for funding COVID-19 emergency response. Whereas by virtue of section 3.1 of the Loans Act, chapter 6405 of the 1990 revised laws of the Commonwealth of Dominica, amended by section four of the Loans Act number four of 1996, the House of Assembly may by resolution authorize the minister responsible for finance to borrow money from approved sources for the purpose of financing general development purposes or other purposes. And whereas since February 2020, government has had to put the necessary infrastructure, human resource and systems in place to mit mitigate against the spread of COVID-19 disease. And whereas the COVID-19 pandemic has negatively impacted economic activity in Dominica, resulting in lower than expected revenues, while government has had to increase expenditure to adequately provide for the health response to the pandemic and sustain livelihoods and the economy. And whereas the October 2020 International Monetary Fund World Economic Outlook envisions that the negative impact of COVID-19 on Caribbean economies, including Dominica's, will continue into calendar year 2021. 
and whereas the government needs to secure additional financing to continue to respond to the health, social, and economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And whereas the government of the Commonwealth of Dominica and the OPEC Fund for International Development have agreed to enter into an agreement whereby the government of the Commonwealth of Dominica will borrow a sum of 10 million United States dollars, equivalent to 27 million Eastern Caribbean dollars. Be it resolved that in accordance with Section 3.1 of the Loans Act, Chapter 6405 of the 1990 Revised Laws of the Commonwealth of Dominica, amended by Section 4 of the Loans Act Number 4 of 1996, this Honorable House authorizes the Minister responsible for finance to borrow a sum not exceeding 10 million United States dollars, equivalent to 27 million Eastern Caribbean dollars from the OPEC Fund for International Development on the following terms. Interest rate, 3% per annum. Service charge, 1% per annum. Repayment, 28 semi-annual installments commencing November 15th of 2024 with a grace period of four years. Mr. Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to negatively affect economic activity in Dominica. While this has resulted in lower than expected revenues, it has also prompted increased expenditure. This circumstance has therefore inhibited the response to healthcare needs, to restore livelihoods, and to stimulate economic activity in the most effective way. The weak revenue performance coupled with the increased expenditure related to COVID-19 pandemic has created a financing gap, Mr. Speaker. Approaches were made to multilateral and bilateral agencies, including the OPEC Fund for International Development, the World Bank, and the Caribbean Development Bank to obtain budgetary support financing that would be used to meet the gap. In August of 2020, the OPEC Fund for International Development approved of a loan in the amount of 10 million United States dollars or 27 million Eastern Caribbean dollars to finance Dominica's public health services. The CDB Board of Directors approved a budget support fund for Dominica last Thursday, Mr. Speaker, and negotiations with the World Bank are on course to be completed by December 31, 2020. The terms of the OPEC Fund for International Development loan are as follows. Interest rate, 3% per annum. Service charge, 1% per annum. Repayment, 28 semi-annual installments commencing November 15th, 2024, with a grace period of four years. Section 3.1 of the Loans Act, Chapter 6405 of the 1990 Revised Laws of the Commonwealth of Dominica, amended by Section 4 of the Loans Act, Number 4 of 1996, authorizes the minister with responsibility for finance to borrow money or guarantee loans from approved sources or guarantee loans to statutory corporations on behalf of the government for the purpose of financing general development or for other purposes by resolution passed in parliament. This loan has been evaluated in the context of government's medium-term debt strategy and is consistent with the objectives of that strategy. Mr. Speaker, this government continues to be very prudent and transparent with its management of the affairs of the country, in particular its finances. 
we have just presented to the Parliament the 2019 Debt Portfolio Review, as promised during this year's budget address. Cabinet recently approved of the development of the Fiscal Rules and Responsibility Framework, which we will take to Parliament by April of next year, as well as the new Public Procurement and Disposal of the Public Property Bill, which we will publish this week to facilitate feedback from stakeholders and the general public. Mr. Speaker, this government understands that we live in a global environment, and from time to time, unforeseen events will gravely affect us. Be it a hurricane, heavy rains, global economic crises, or, or the current COVID-19 pandemic. We are learning from our past experiences and putting systems to ensure that lives, livelihoods, government's finances, and the economy can better sustain the impact of those events. Mr. Speaker, with these few words, I commend the resolution to this honorable house for approval. Thank you. The motion is before the house for debate. Recognize um, Senator Honorable Ernie Lawrence Joseph. John, yes, yeah, son John Finn. Mr. Speaker, I rise to make my contribution to this debate and the authorization for a loan from OPEC, from the OPEC Fund for international development for funding COVID-19 emergency response. Mr. Speaker, debt is a two-edged sword, used wisely and in moderation. It clearly improves welfare. But when it is used imprudently, and in excess, the result can be disaster. For any individual, household, firm, organizations, or government, overborrowing can lead to bankruptcy and financial ruin. Similarly, for a country, too much debt impairs the government's ability to deliver essential services to its citizens. In the case of Dominica, the purpose of this loan is to continue to respond to the health, social, and economic impact of the COVID pandemic. The resolution reads, And whereas since February 2020, government has had to put the necessary infrastructure, human resource, and systems in place to mitigate against the spread of the COVID-19 disease. Mr. Speaker, it is now 10 months. While it is true that we are doing well containing this virus, we should not take anything for granted. By now, we should have a clear strategy to include budget, sources of finance, and manpower needs to respond adequately to this pande pandemic. Instead of this piecemeal approach, we are so often we come to parliament to seek approval of loan financing without any medium or long-term plan to fight this pandemic. <laughs> Additionally, Mr. Speaker, while we continue to seek these loan approvals, questions of transparency and
and accountability surrounding our main source of revenue, the CBI program, remains unanswered or ignored. The resolution continues. The government needs additional funding to continue to respond to the health, social, and economic impact of COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, social and economic impact. I think this means the government has attended to the social and economic um, needs, sorry, of, of its people, but it wants to continue to do so. But is this really so? Did this really happen? Dominicans envied their colleagues in the neighboring islands who received stimulus packages. The money placed at the aid bank to unlend is difficult to access for the majority who need it. It was not forthcoming. Or if a few persons succeeded, it was extremely difficult. Also, Mr. Speaker, from all reports, assistance managed by the Dominica Social Security is selective with respect to approvals. Many qualified applicants are reporting that they either needed a red card or a red employer member, for their application member, to member, advance under that program. Member, the part where you said selective is imputing improper motive. Yes, very much so. Especially to people who are not in the house. Yes. They cannot defend yes. Yeah. So I'll ask you to withdraw yeah. that section. Okay, I withdraw, Mr. Speaker. I withdraw, Mr. Speaker. I I'm not hearing you, you know. You can't hear me? No. I withdraw, Mr. Speaker. Okay. Proceed. That's Proceed. It. Can I move on, Mr. Speaker? Proceed. Can I, can I? In April, Mr. Speaker, I read somewhere in an article, I read an article somewhere which stated in April of 2020, the International Monetary Fund provided a loan of $14 million US to help the government mitigate against COVID-19. Also, the World Bank provided $6.6 .6 million as funding. Can we have details Mr. Speaker, I really, as to how Mr. this Speaker, money is Mr. Speaker, I rise spent to the point of order. and the balance Colleague, if members. not member, yet spent? Member, member, so, the Honorable Minister rise on a point of order. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I really don't want to be interrupting the member so often, Mr. Speaker. But as a young parliamentarian, I'd like to help the, the honorable member of this one. Mr. Speaker, you cannot quote from sources without the permission of the honorable speaker of yours. First of all, Mr. Speaker. And secondly, Mr. Speaker, even if you have the permission, Mr. Speaker, you have to have the information with you, Mr. Speaker, here in the house. This is, this is against the rules of the house. You, you cannot quote from sources without the permission of the speaker. You cannot do it. So, Mr. Speaker, so mem can I continue? Speaker, can I continue? Yes, so the section where you actually quoting, I agree with the Honorable Minister, that you cannot be quoting and we don't have the substantial matter. So we've drawn the section. We've drew, so the government did not receive 14 million US dollars from IMF? Well, I don't know. Your quote you, is how you quoted it. You understand? Again, I would ask members, again. Not at all. Honorable John. Honorable Hector John, you are disturbing even your member. Honorable Speaker of the House, do you have a problem with me? I'm speaking to my member. No, no, no. Okay. I'm, I'm, on the, I'm on the floor speaking to the member. There. I'm on the floor so, in the House as well. So, yes, so, me, so me, as we indicated to you, you can be quoting things out of context and okay. okay. So proceed Thank you. and focus on relevance. 
Mr. Speaker. Continue. Thank, continue. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, some COVID facilities are making a mint based on the costs that I saw from poor returning Dominicans who stayed in some of these facilities, particularly the Lilac Building. This privately owned facility is making lots of money on again, Dominicans. Again, member. More money than member, it made when, member, when Ross member, was there. Member, member, I'm asking you to withdraw this section which deals with the Lilac Building. But you are imputing improper motive. I withdraw it. I withdraw it, Mr. Speaker. Anna, Can I continue? No, no. Put off your mic a second. Please put off the mic. Mr. Speaker. Please put off the mic so I can talk to you. Members, again, in this honorable house, you cannot call names or company names or person names unless if you actually talking in the positive, congratulating somebody. You cannot. So this honorable house is not a, 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 a place for gossip and for any windows. So please. We do not want to be interjecting every minute, but please be guided accordingly. Your mic is off and I will not tolerate that anymore. Eh? I'm, I'm indicating to you again, focus on relevance. There are clear rules. You can't be calling names. You know what you are trying to do by saying a lilac billing. This is a point of contention on radio for many years. So people have an idea what you're talking about. Well, what is that? Thank so you, if, if you continue, I'll ask you to take your seat. And Honorable Mr. John, put off your mic, please. Your mic is on, Honorable John. Can I continue, Mr. Speaker? Yes, continue. Mi Mr. Speaker. Member, member, put off your mic again. <laughs> honorable Hector John, you are disturbing this honorable house. You are disturbing this honorable house, talking at the top of your voice. D disturbing, disturbing your member. Absolutely none. I will answer any of them. Disturbing, disturbing and distracting your member who is presenting. And the public, the public need to be aware of those things. That there are clear rules, your member is on her feet speaking and you are distracting her in crosstalk. It's a good Christmas season there, but I am not going to tolerate any nonsense in this honorable house. If you persist, I'll ask you to leave. Continue, Senator. Mr. Speaker, I would imagine that poor people coming back home after they have lost their jobs overseas, or locals who are placed in quarantine, some of those fees would be wavered, or even all of the fees would be wavered on their behalf. Dominicans are out of jobs. Farmers are struggling, bus drivers are struggling, everybody is struggling. Everybody's feeling the squeeze of that pandemic. We need the government to come to the rescue of Dominicans. Not some, but all Dominicans. What justification do we have to take $27 million from OPEC, OPEC sorry, when we have a source to front load $1 billion? Don't we have to pay back that $1 billion? 
Why hasn't this one billion dollars been brought to parliament for approval? Is it because, is it because it is our money? As a matter of fact, we should not be borrowing any money from any source because we have $2.8 billion lying somewhere. We can take the $27 million Me from it and then Senator, Senator, the Senator, COVID Senator, Senator, Senator. Yes, sir, I'm listening you to you. You have to withdraw that statement again. Um, I don't know if the members don't understand what imputing improper motive means. I will just give a clear example. If you are saying something without the protection of parliament and you are outside, and you can be sued for it, or it is putting a person in bad light, you are not supposed to do that. You are actually saying about something about some billion dollars somewhere. So, so, so remember again continue, for the members, the, the, the members who have just come in as parliamentarians and or senators, remember when you come with those types of approaches, I must allow a response if, if the other side chooses to respond. Remember that. And that is what creates the contention in this honorable house. Because if, if you are trying to impute improper motive to put the government in bad light, the government has a responsibility to the people to respond. And remember, I've been on both sides, so I understand. And that's why I've been cautioning you guys, trying to explain to you that I'm allowing you. That's why I said earlier that if any member on the opposition side wishes to speak, please stand. I'm allowing you guys, I'm taking a lot of patience, exercising a lot of patience. Please be guided. Please be guided. Can I continue, Mr. Speaker? I said yes, you could continue. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, a big consequence of all this debt is that the burden shifts from one generation to the next. Mr. Speaker, Dominica has a high, high debt. I stand to correction. From February to now, that is if this $27 million is approved, the debt for this short period will amount to $338 million. How are we going to repay that debt? M many of us will have gone. Many of us will have gone. It's our children and our grandchildren who will be in this mess we are, which is being created right now. What mechanisms are being put in place to help us pay this exorbitant debt? We don't have industries. We don't have manufacturing plant. Where is Bello? Where is um, Kubuli? Where is Lubia Spring Water? Where are they? They have all gone and no job creation. If the economy is growing, then we would say the next generation would be better off. But the way it is now, Dominica's economy is not growing. And with such a poor economy, low economic growth rates, those coming after us will be in serious trouble. For these reasons, Mr. Speaker, and more, we continue to demand greater accountability and the transparency of state funds, which would go or should go towards reducing our demands for loans. As it stands now, Mr. Speaker, the main source of employment for young people in this country is the National Employment Program, and not all of them. Young people need jobs. Too many of our young men and women are on the roadside. They need to make themselves marketable in order to make a meaningful contribution to society. We need electricians. We need plumbers. 
We need skilled men and women. They need to be self-reliant. They need to be enterprising so they can contribute meaningfully. And the, they depend on the government to create that opportunity to give them the push so they can do what they're supposed to do. What I have been learning lately, Mr. Speaker, what I have been told lately, it is if you are not a labor right, your name is off the list. That's what I was told. Off the list to get a job, to get a um, um, whatever, to get whatever. That's what I was told, Mr. Speaker. Mem member, again, again. Only supporters member, of Dominica. Member, yes, yes, Mr. You are imputing improper motive. You are saying that the government is selective. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, if this is happening, I do not know, I'm not sure, but if it is happening, this is morally and spiritually wrong. But, but it is spiritually and morally member, wrong. Member, member, okay? member, member, this is your last caution. You said you withdraw and you continue with the point. Mr. Speaker. Member, reiterate your withdrawal. So, so do not continue in that line. So do not continue in that line. Please. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as I end, as I end, let me remind us that taking on huge sums of borrowing comes with risk. And we all know what happens when risk develops in our nation's finances. There will be rising costs, there will be higher taxes, and we know that can propel people on fixed incomes into poverty. And this is already happening. The high cost of living is negatively affecting the livelihood of our people. Mr. Speaker, the government must manage and reduce its borrowing levels over the coming years in order to move our finances to a more balanced position. It would be a travesty, Mr. Speaker, to have a national debt that is bigger than our national income, and that would spell disaster for Dominica. Instead of a growing debt burden, we must commit ourselves to using state-raised revenues more wisely, particularly in these economically difficult times. In this regard, we must ensure that all our revenues raised under the CBI program are fully accounted for. We must review this so-called housing program, which which, Mr. Mem Speaker, member, you yes. cannot say so-called housing program. So say the housing program, sir? It's a housing program. Fine. I take that back, and I'm going to, re I'm going to re restate. Mr. Speaker, we must review the housing revolution program under which red card holders are smiling all the way to the bank. The bulk of these funds should now be challenged or channeled to sustainable economic seven, activities seven more minutes. to help create sustainable funds, sustainable jobs, reduce our debt burden and dependency on loans to fight this current health crisis. Mr. Speaker, while I support the purpose for which the money is going to be used, I do not support taking a loan to do it. The monies we have, we can use from it to fund the COVID-19 um, pandemic and help fight it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recognize Honorable Gregory Revere, but before Honorable Gregory Revere speak, I want to just caution members in this Honorable House that this Honorable House is not a political platform. 
and therefore we have rules governing. So I had to interject so many times and there are instances where the Honorable Senator was imputing improper motive, but I really just got frustrated there with her approach. So I'm cautioning other people, the other members on both sides, that this is not a political platform. Yeah, yeah, I'll allow, I'll allow both sides the opportunity to respond to each other. Co um, proceed, Honorable Rivier. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to begin by referencing uh, the opinion of the previous member as it relates to debt. And permit me, Mr. Speaker, to inform this honorable house. Honorable Gregory Rivier, you know the order, you know you need to call the name Senator John Finn. Okay. Thank you very you much. You need to say yes. If he's a senator, you call the name Senator S John, John Finn, Finn or Senator. If he's a minister, honorable minister. Thank you if he's a much. rep, you see the pal rep, parliamentary representative for whichever constituency. I prefer Senator John Finn. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, I just want to respond to Senator John Finn's remark as it relates to debt. Let me inform this honorable house that debt is not all that bad. Debt is not all that bad. What is really bad, Mr. Speaker, is reckless borrowing. What is really bad is unsustainable debt. What is really bad, Mr. Speaker, is the inability to manage those debt. That is what is bad, Mr. Speaker. That is what is bad. Not the ability to acquire debt. And I can tell you, that even countries like the great America, who is actually making money, they are in trillions of dollars debt. And I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, that the only way a bank will call you is because, one, you have the capacity to repay, Mr. Speaker. And another reason why a bank will call you, Mr. Speaker, is because you have the character, which means that if you are given money, you will not run and hide and divert, but you will pay back, Mr. Speaker. So I just wanted to educate in a very cordial way, Senator John Finn, as it relates to debt. Mr. Speaker, <coughs> Not long ago, Dominica was confronted with one of the worst and most impactful disasters the world has ever seen. Now, this COVID-19 pandemic is another monster, an unwelcoming presence, Mr. Speaker. The impact of that virus on global community clearly demonstrated that the world, including Dominica, has a long way to go to ensure sustained policy responses that can be successful in protecting households, business from the worst ravages. Mr. Speaker, we have not yet shaken off the dust from Maria. Here comes another crisis. A pandemic, a pandemic we realize that can affect absolutely everyone, everywhere, and multiple sectors at the same time. Mr. Speaker, permit me to reference report from three major creditable organizations on this global crisis. You are permitted, you are permitted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
That's how it's done. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, I want to make reference to the International Monetary Fund. I want to make reference to the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. And I also want to make reference to Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean ECLAP. Mr. Speaker, in April 2020, the International Monetary Fund projected that growth in the Caribbean region would contract by 6.2% in 2020. And this would be the deepest recession in more than half a century, Mr. Speaker. The IMF cautioned that as countries begin to open their domestic economies, they will still be challenged by these external shocks. Mr. Speaker, the latest IMF World Economic Outlook report published in October 2020 showed that the extent of the contraction in real GDP of Caribbean countries will be more subdued at 5.4% compared to growth of 0.7% in 2019. Growth in real GDP is estimated to resume at 3.9%, ladies and gentlemen, but that is in 2021. The disruption in global and regional supply chain was expected to result in an increase in consumer prices. With the IMF projecting consumer prices to move by 7.1% in 2020 compared to 4.2% in 2019, a 7.8% increase in consumer prices projected in 2021. Mr. Speaker, for the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, according to the IMF, October 2020 World Economic Outlook Report, real GDP is projected to contract by 15.1% in 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the kind of environment that we are talking about. In its report in May 2020 on assessing economic impact on the coronavirus, the Latin America and the Caribbean ECLAC asserted the pandemic has sent shock waves, Mr. Speaker, shock waves through societies and economies, forcing us to be more creative, increase experience sharing, strengthen peer learning, and take advantage of multilateralism at the same time, when cooperation and collaboration among stakeholders, of course, is very vital at this current time, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, ECLAC further reports that the pandemic will result in the region's worst economic and social crisis in decade, with highly damaging effects on employment and fight against poverty and the reduction of inequality. Mr. Speaker, all these reports are saying to us is that now is the time to tie our waist, Mr. Speaker. Now is the time to tie our waist. Allow me to provide a bit of an overview of the recent economic condition in Dominica. Pre-COVID and highlighting some important emerging post-COVID issues. By the end of 2019, real economic activity in the country expanded by an estimated 5.66% compared to 266 in 2018. The major contribution came from agriculture, Mr. Speaker. Some people don't like to talk about agriculture. 
But the major contribution came from agriculture, livestock, and forestry, Mr. Speaker. We also see the construction sector expanding by 6.7% in 2019. In addition, Mr. Speaker, there was also positive growth in tourism. The tourism sector, tourist arrival increased by over 42.6% in 2019, Mr. Speaker. Stay over tourists increase by 41%. So that was the kind of environment, Mr. Speaker, we were enjoying before this COVID pandemic take over. Mr. Speaker, there was every sign that this country was on a growth trajectory. We didn't have to go and look for money nowhere, Mr. Speaker, because we were not sure, we, we were not faced by this dreadful pandemic, Mr. Speaker. Alas, there was a silver lining. But after the emergence of COVID-19 virus in March 2020, the pandemic took us a few steps backward and worsened some of our development challenges, Mr. Speaker. Lest we forget that we are still progressing in spite of the pandemic. We are still pro progressing towards a better and fully equipped health system. And we have health centers being built all over, all over. And I want to say that we are putting the, we are doing the landscaping now for the Marigot brand new health center, which will be declared as the Doris Musgrave Health and Wellness Center, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, while we are faced with this pandemic, we still continue to do all that we are doing. We have the construction of the Dominica China Friendship Hospital. We have the construction of the new Marigot Hospital, Mr. Speaker. We have housing developments all over the country, Mr. Speaker. Roads continue to be improved. All safety nets, um, ladies and gentlemen, we ensure that people get all their monies and not one worker. And that is so important. And that is the reason why we have to commend our Minister of Finance. Not one person has been sent home, even in this dreadful time, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have seen sharp increase in expenditures as we put measures in place to mitigate the impact of the virus. And at the same time, many have alluded to the significant drop in revenue collection. For example, even the blind could see, Mr. Speaker, the impact travel restriction and protocols are having on our tourism sector. Mr. Speaker, COVID-19 has impacted every aspect of the Dominican life. From commerce and trade, finance and banking, food security, market access, employment and livelihood, Mr. Speaker, just name it, COVID-19 has impacted us. Now, Mr. Speaker, in response, of course, I must say that the government of Dominica has put quite a number of measures in place to deal and to address with that to address that threat substantial investment were made in the augmentation of public health infrastructures we had to retrofit an existing facility to serve as a covid hospital and i really want to commend the people in portsmouth and the gentleman what was his name, Honorable Ian? Huh? Mr. Warrington Hamilton for giving us a hospital in less than a week, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, 
We have to lease facilities to accommodate national health workers and the Cuban Medical Brigade. We have to lease um, facilities for quarantine, Mr. Speaker. We have to establish an isolation unit at the country's main hospital, the Dominica China Friendship Hospital. Those efforts were laudable in keeping the number of reported cases low, Mr. Speaker, and having a record, having a record, Mr. Speaker, of absolutely no death, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, these measures resulted in drastic decline in central government revenues, and at the same time, increasing expenditure rapidly to contain the spread of the virus. By the end of September, we were in the early stage of phase two, and our local resources had already exceeded 21 million for the containment and minimization of community transmission. Mr. Speaker, the dead end of COVID is long ahead. You can imagine what the expense will be like to ensure that the curve does not spike. Mr. Speaker, we have to continue to ensure that all lives are touched particularly those who are vulnerable among us, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have to ensure that there are, well, of course, we have ensured, Mr. Speaker, that persons were given cash grants. Persons were given cash grants all over Dominica, and we did not choose who to give. Everybody benefited, Mr. Speaker. Red benefited, green benefited, blue vet benefited, even navy blue benefited, Mr. Speaker. Everybody benefited, Mr. Speaker. Because of our prudent fiscal management, our high level of transparency and accountability, Many organizations like the World Bank, the IMF, the ECCB, and now OPEC are saying that we have confidence in the way this Labour Party government is managing its resources, Mr. Speaker. As such, we are providing loans, they are providing loans, Mr. Speaker, at concessionary rates, resources, that will give us some spending room to cushion any further economic and social impact. Mr. Speaker, the high cost associated with managing new cases and preventing additional risk can be met through this loan as an opportunity within the available policy space to the most needed areas to protect lives and livelihoods and to enable a resilient recovery. Mr. Speaker, I assure you that this Labour Party government remains unbendable to the priority sector of public investment. Public investment in housing, health, water, sanitation, and of course, the digital economy. The government remains steadfast to the following policy stance, which is consistently articulated. Target economic and social support. Encourage job creation maintenance of public investment projects, reprioritization of projects where possible. Those are some of the things that we are doing when we sit in cabinet. We are not sitting, talking, making joke, and having fun. We are doing 
the people's business, Mr. Speaker. We are doing the people's business. COVID-19 and its associated health cost amplified by increased expenditures and reduced government revenues necessitate policy response to guarantee the survival of Dominica and its citizens and their lives and livelihoods. Many government revenue streams such as tourism, port activities, sporting event, musical festivals are unlikely to return to pre-pandemic level for years, Mr. Speaker. With the uncertainty of the duration of this pandemic, government at some point has to increase the debt level to prevent our people from falling deeper into poverty or to avoid a situation of widened social and economic inequality. Mr. Speaker, under this Labour Party government, we have made great development progress, including reducing poverty and inequality. We need to continue these efforts. We need to preserve the gains that we've made so far, Mr. Speaker. And access to resources is a major factor. Thanks to all our development partners who continue to come to our aid. This government is always forward thinking, Mr. Speaker. We have to think beyond COVID. This is the only way we can avoid economic collapse. Before the crisis, at a national level, we were on our way to prov the provision of universal service in healthcare, education. Our infant and maternal mortality rate was significantly reduced. Indigence level was slashed, and many were lifted out of poverty. Undernourishment and hunger were almost non-existent. Quality of education had improved, reflected in student performance at national and regional examination. And employment opportunities expanded through public works program and construction. Mr. Speaker, how we recover from this pandemic depends on the action all of us take as Dominicans. This fast-moving crisis is challenging us to respond in a way beyond what we did for Tropical Storm Erica and Hurricane Maria. Mr. Speaker, this government continues to prioritize health and welfare of its citizens. All considerations must be given to health and safety of Dominicans, Mr. Speaker. All. Mr. Speaker, in closing, in closing, as a young and fledgling leader, yet one with a vision and passion for this blessed nation. I urge us all in this audience to use this opportunity to recalibrate, rethink, and reintroduce creative ideas that can focus our effort in containment, treatment for the economic survival of this country. Our labor market, financial landscape, foreign relations, and socialization culture will never be the same again. Mr. Speaker, our size has not been our limitation. By the grace of God, we have proven that we have been able to combat and ride over the virus 
with far greater efficiency than all the developed countries all over the world, Mr. Speaker. Let us all collectively support this loan to mitigate any further spread of COVID-19 and to debilitate the impact as we aim to put Dominica in an even better position to promote the well-being of our citizen. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move that this Honorable House be suspended until 3 p.m. this afternoon. Second. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Second, Mr. Speaker. It has been moved and seconded that this house stand suspended at 3 p.m. Two, two? Until 3 p.m. this afternoon. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. House stand suspended until 3 p.m.